Uh, it's entitled A Creative Look at Strategies and Solutions for Donors and Their Charitable Goals. Uh, just a word or two about the Legacy Planning Committee and then the, um, and then I'll uh, hop into a few words about Families First before uh, uh, calling upon each of our, really, we have a really distinguished panel here this morning. So I'm very, very excited to hear the latest trips, uh, tips and strategies that, uh, that they're gonna share uh, with us today for anyone that has uh, a charitable intent and also uh, anyone who may have known someone who has uh, uh, some charitable goals uh, to accomplish before the end of the year. Um, the Legacy Planning Committee was formed several years ago because um, if you look around at any you know, uh, longstanding charity, uh, one, of the, one of the things that they always put at the forefront is to have a strong uh, foundation endowment that will ensure the long-term stability of any organization. And that is exactly where Families First finds themselves. Uh, we don't want to be dependent upon um, you know, funding from different sources, government fundings, who wins elections, who loses elections. We want to have a core nucleus, uh, solid foundation so that we can continue all the great programs and in fact expand all the great programs that we have in Palm Beach County. Uh, let me just tell you, for those of you who don't know, or those of you who need a refresher, uh, a little bit about Families First. Since its inception in 1990, Families First mission has been to offer programs and services that address the well-being of children and families so that all can become thriving and self-sufficient individuals. The agency's mission statement is to advance the well-being of children and families through high-quality programs and prevention, early intervention, child development, behavioral health, education, and advocacy. Our vision is to be a leader in providing outstanding programs and services for families so children grow up in a safe and loving home that lead to stronger families and stronger communities. Families First helps them build on the strengths of children and families and designs individual plans that meet each family's specific needs. Consequently, our programs save taxpayers millions of dollars in the cost of special education, delinquency, and dependency services needed to fix issues after they have occurred. I would now like to introduce Andres Torrens. He does a fantastic job uh, for Families First. He joined Families First in 2016 as Clinical Director of Behavior Health Services after more than 25 years in the social work field. He obtained his uh, MSW from Hunter College School of Social Work, completed his postgraduate training at the Ackerman Institute for the Family, and has received extensive training on the subject of child sexual abuse and trauma. And he is going to uh, just give a short presentation about some of the great work uh, that Families First does. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Andres to take over. Thank you, Brian. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, so as Brian said, I'm Andres Torrance. I'm the clinical director of the Behavioral Health Program. It's a program that we started at Families First several years ago. Um, we serve children birth to 22 in this program. We have a, a section of our program or department of our program that works with very young children or early childhood program um, clients, uh, ages birth to five and their families and their caretakers. We also uh, do general counseling with school-aged children ages 6 to 18, along with their caretaking um, families. We work with young adults as well, because many programs in, in Palm Beach County and throughout the state um, typically work with children up until the age of 18. So when a child turns 18, they're no longer eligible for us for those services. We work with children um, up until 22. So after they're 18 and they're still in high school or some kind of a trade school, or even college, we can still work with that youth um, so long as they're attending some kind of uh, educational or academic training program. We work with adults who are actively parenting so that, you know, so we do accept referrals for parents who are coming in who are being referred to us because they're experiencing some behavioral health or mental health issues, but they are actively parenting as well. So it's not their child that's having the challenges with respect to their mental health or behavioral health, it could be the parent. We collaborate with several agencies throughout Palm Beach County to offer their staff and their clients training, support, um, and services. One of the newest 
projects that we had is a program that we, um, or a section of our behavioral health program, where we work with the school district, the Palm Beach County School District. So we have several of our behavioral health clinicians co-located in schools throughout Palm Beach County, from uh, Boca, from Del Rey, all the way up to um, Riviera Beach and out to Bell Glade. So we are currently working in six schools. We have five clinicians working in these schools. Many of the students that work, that we see um, in these schools are at risk uh, for um, failing out academically, uh, having severe ch challenges with respect to behavior. Uh, they come to us experiencing issues related to their home life. And so one of our goals is to try to maintain stability in the home, preventing children from going out of the home for that, um, for that support, namely with gangs and other issues and other um, groups that, that uh, exist in their communities. We work with many children uh, in, throughout these schools that have long and extensive histories of trauma and loss. When we, when we receive a referral of a, of a youth in one of these schools, more often than not, they're referred because they're failing out and they're having some uh, difficulty succeeding academically. And when our clinicians get them into the room with the parent, it is then that we discover um, what could be a long history of trauma of abuse uh, that no one has ever uh, uncovered or even asked. That what the teachers and what the academic staff are seeing is that they're failing grades or that they are not coming to school and they, they haven't gone past that. So um, it's so vital for our staff to be co-located in these schools and have the opportunity to connect with these families and learn about what it is that they're uh, experiencing. One of the cases that we recently worked with or have worked with um, over the summer, uh, or actually the late spring and into the summer, and then we currently are working with them as well, is a case that we're of a 14-year-old girl that we took on in Belle Glade. When we took on this case, we, we were told that, again, the child uh, seemed sad, seemed um, disconnected from her peers, from school, from wanting to be in, in school. This was in the, in the heat of the pandemic. So we started with her uh, face to face, um, but then quickly had to roll over to uh, remote because all the schools closed down in, uh, at the end of April, at the end of March. And so when we resume, we resume with her uh, on camera and, do, and engaging in telehealth. What we learned from this young um, girl when she was referred to us was, um, so she was referred in, in somewhat in April. So we started working with her again, face to face, uh, but then we, uh, we learned that she, her mom had been severely ill and then ultimately lost her life. So her mom had passed away and it was discovered after, after some um, gaining her trust and working with her that her mom actually passed away from COVID. She had contracted COVID. She was one of the early cases, I'm guessing, of, of people, of individuals who contracted COVID and she passed away, uh, leaving this 14-year-old and her 18-year-old sister to be raised by their dad. Um, so now he, he is a single dad. So what was so important about this child and about working with her and helping her develop coping skills and get through the grief of losing her mom is uh, obvious with, you know, some, somewhat obvious is the fact that she was a 14 year old. And we all know that 14 year old, and I don't wanna sound um, sexist in any way, but 14 year old females really do turn and have a, a, a unique connection to their moms. So um, she now no longer had her mom with her. So the therapist started working with her and what was, uh, what was asked of her was that she continue to work with her over the summer. So we were able to, through, through some funding and through um, some unique opportunities with the agency and donations, we were able to continue her therapy outside of the school district or the school district stopped uh, at the end of May. And then when August came around, uh, the family was very scared that we would again, not be able to work with her because she was still experiencing some severe issues. And we once again said, no, we're there with you. We reopened her case when the school district opened up schools again. And we're happy to say that, you know, she's coming along, she's far from, um, you know, I don't know if anyone ever recovers from such a, a traumatic loss like this, but, um, but she is coming along. She is coming to school every day. She is looking for the therapist who's in the school. 
and she is making progress slowly, but she's making progress. This family was uh, adopted by a generous donor for, for Christmas so that we could give this family um, a little bit of a, of a brighter Christmas uh, given everything that they've been through. So that's just one story. We have countless stories like this, but that's one story of the, of the children and families that we work with in behavioral health. Wow, that is just, uh, just wonderful work. Um, and you know, when I hear stories, that individual story like Andre's just shared with us, um, it reminds me of why I got involved in this organization to begin with. Uh, for those of you who may have heard me speak in the past, I always refer to, you know, the, the, the saying, you know, no, the program, no child left behind. I really believe that there should be no child's dream left behind. And when you hear a 14 year old who lost her mom in an agency like Families First, that, by the way, it's not a band aid approach. They, as you heard Andre say, they are working with her. It's a continuing program and they're gonna give her stability and give her the best chance so she can realize her dreams. And that's really what this organization is all about. So thank you again, Andres. I really appreciate all the great work that you do. Our next speaker is Andrea Mills. We're very fortunate to have her. Uh, she is a principal at um, Financial uh, Management Associates. Uh, Andrea has extensive experience helping Nonprofits, individuals, and foundations make important fiscal decisions. A sought after trainer and speaker, Andrea presents nationwide on a variety of nonprofit financial management topics. We are so fortunate to have her here today. And do your thing, Andrea. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Andrea, too, for that story. And so uh, I wanted to just kind of set the, the frame of what we've been uh, seeing. So SMA is a, a nationally based niche consulting practice. I'm actually under the umbrella of MBAF. I think some of you are familiar with the MBAF uh, family that's down here. And um, we are all about building internal infrastructure and organizations. And it, and it could be on a, with a finance lens or it's with technology. Uh, and so we get to see a variety of organizations. They come in all shapes and sizes when we're working with organizations. We also do a lot of work with funders too, but for the purposes of this conversation, I want to focus on what we've been seeing um, during this uh, a, a pandemic. I hate to say that word, but during this pandemic and what we've all been going through with the organizations that we work with. So one of the things um, I wanted to just uh, give us a, a, a kind of a, a difference um, of what we are we're seeing happening today than what was happening back in 2008 and 2009 during the economic downturn, as we all remember that that time um, when with working with our organizations. Um, one of the things that we have seen, um, which is different this time around, is the fa the funder response to uh, the pandemic and supporting organizations. And so back in 2008, 2009, when the economic calamity hit, we, of course, have a lot of foundation funder uh, relationships. So we, you know, we're, we were waiting for the funder community to, you know, say, okay, FMA, what should we do? And they kind of closed their doors. Um, we were working with a very large funder called the Wallace Foundation. And that was pretty much, you know, in terms of when we looked at other parties at the table, there were a lot of people that were not really um, figuring out how to support the a not-for-profit community. Um, I, I can honestly say during this um, crisis, uh, the phone rang at FMA and the foundation community said, you know, how can we help? And so we went back to the table, you know, of course we always have our long list of 25 things, um, but we said, we know there, that organizations are gonna need to deal with what if, we'll call it scenario planning. Organizations are gonna need help with reserves and cash flow and they need to be healthy. And organizations are gonna need help with technology, as you can imagine, because we were all going to virtual environments. And, um, and so the foundation community did help. And so if, um, if you have any time to go and take a look at our website, we did a lot of work with PPP in terms of when that um, all started to roll out. We said, we've gotta get organizations, PPP money, we've gotta be at the table, um, we need to have clinics, 
we need to have hand holding, we need to have support, and, and we want to help them. So on our website, you'll see a list of over 22 foundations, um, some Florida based, that did support the, P the PPP movement. And we can honestly say we were, you know, we have a guesstimate on, but we we're saying now we were able to get about over $163 million into the arms of nonprofit organizations with PPP funding. And, um, and so now, of course, we're all going through forgiveness. And um, so we've been doing a lot of work um, around that. But it was, it was something that had changed, you know, when we looked at what was happening way back when and what is happening now. Now, one of the things that I do want to stress, and when we talk about the financial health of an organization, and we are, we are always banging this drum, the dr our mantra of you need to build reserves in any organization. It's key that you have those reserves. And whenever there's a crisis or something that hits, we see that those organizations that have reserves are able to continue programs. They do not have to lay off staff, so morale doesn't change. So programmatically, their functioning in the, in the environment and the community doesn't see. Um, so, and then those organizations that, that we're not thinking about, strategically thinking about how do I build reserves, they um, are the ones that have challenges whenever we see something like this happen. And so, um, when you think about an organization like Families First, and, and taking a step back many years ago and saying, we really need to put together a legacy planning committee. We really need to think about what's our financial health? What does it look like? Um, that's key in terms of when we look at um, the financial viability of organizations and being able to not stop programmatic endeavors and programmatic quality and also continue to serve um, the organizations that, that they're serving um, and the people that they're serving in the community. So um, our organizations have you know, been through a variety of different things happening right now. I could say our food programs, any organizations that we deal with with food, they've been growing exponentially because of the fact of you know, making sure that need is being fulfilled. But in, in closing, um, I just wanted to I also um, mention a website that we created. And there's a lot of wonderful tools that are there. And there's a whole section in the governance area that um, is there for, um, for you as leaders um, in terms of when you're helping organizations that you're working with. And it's, the website is www.strongnonprofits.org. And that's strongnonprofits.org. I'll, I'll type it in the chat. And um, I highly recommend um, take a look at uh, that, the area, especially in governance, in that, in that um, area of governance, we've got an operating reserve policy toolkit, and it discusses why reserves are important. It discusses how you should show your reserves on your financials and work with your auditors. And it's, it's really key in terms of when we think about organizations um, and their thoughts, their strategic thoughts around building long-term viability. So I wanted to um, pass it back to Brian. Oh, thank you again so much, uh, so much great information and really, um, I think I'm going to really underscore the point of really what, um, why it's so important for Families First as any other charity to really have a legacy planning, a strategic plan in place, which we do have a strategic plan. Uh, we are gaining traction and we've made some progress in building our endowment, uh, but it's a continuing, never-ending um, effort and we'll be sure to check that, uh, that website out. By the way, if anyone has any questions as they hear go along, please type them in the chat room. We have some time at the end for questions and maybe I'll sneak a few in during the presentation if it's appropriate. Uh, but that was really, really, uh, really helpful. So thank you so much. Really appreciate you being here. Um, and so now um, let me continue to move on because I know we're, we're trying to stay on a timeline here today. Uh, I'm gonna introduce Robin King, uh, a state planning attorney. Uh, Robin is the founding member of King Law. She's a graduate of the Miami Law School and concentrates her practice in all aspects of estate planning, guardianship, and probate and trust administration. Ms. King is notable for extensive counsel and representation of LGBT families and in all manners of estate planning. And so, uh, so thankful to have you here, Robin. Please uh, tell us what's, what's going on in the charitable estate planning world these days. Thanks, Brian. Uh, today, I just want to take a few minutes to talk to you about the importance of estate planning 
and then charitable planning and why giving back should be part of your estate plan. It's so important during these trying times to understand and realize the importance of getting your estate plan together to protect yourself and your families. Without estate planning, you don't get to decide who gets everything at your death that you work so hard for. And estate planning, you have to remember, isn't only for the rich. And without a plan in place, settling your affairs after your death um, might have unintended consequences of disinheriting those who you love and are not related to you, and also charities and other organizations you might want to leave your assets to. Estate planning allows you to choose who will inherit your assets, and estate planning affords you the chance to distribute assets to charitable organizations such as Families First that you wish to support. And without estate planning, I just wanted to tell you, state statutes and or the courts, perhaps after costly legal battles and fees, dictate who gets your property at your death. For instance, in Florida, our Florida state statutes don't provide for unmarried individuals living together, friends, or two distant relatives, and or charitable organizations to inherit your assets. Our state statutes only provide for those related for you to inherit. And estate planning also allows you the opportunity to reduce income taxes during your life and reduce a lot or even all your federal estate taxes. And depending upon the state you're domiciled in, state estate taxes and state inheritance taxes. But we all know what estate planning is. It's the legal documents such as a will and or a trust can be a revocable or irrevocable trust. And also remember, you could have more than one type of trust, but in Florida, you also have to remember you can only have one will that details how you want your assets distributed when you pass away. And in Florida, when a person dies and has a will, we call that a testate estate. Without a will, we call that an intestate estate. And it's extremely important that when you die, you have a testate estate, you have a will or a trust, and it's important that you meet with your advisors to prepare your estate planning. And just as a side note, because I've had a little bit of experience with this, um, don't depend on those internet will programs that you can prepare your own documents, because they may not be geared specifically to the state you're domiciled in. For example, here in Florida, you might want to leave your entire estate to a charity. But if you're married and domiciled in Florida, unless you have a pre or post nuptial agreement, you need to leave by statute 30% of your estate to your spouse, and that's called the elective share. That's why it's really important to meet with uh, people who have a background in estate planning so they can assist you in making sure your estate plan is correct. A comprehensive estate plan helps you feel more confident about the future, knowing your family and other organizations will be taken care of, and that the legacy you leave behind is the one you want. So giving back to charities and organizations you should support should be start, uh, part of your estate planning. People like to give back to charities they're passionate about because if nothing else, it makes you feel good. There's a certain satisfaction you get knowing that you're doing well for someone or some, something else. Charitable planning, giving is an essential part of our society. For many people, supporting charities is an important part of their life. It's the importance of giving back to the community you care about and allows you to create your own lasting legacy. So one of the most important ways to help support charities you care about during this trying time, when we're all trying to figure out, it, and I hate the term uh, new normal also, is to discuss how you can include charitable giving in your estate plan. And charitable planning in your estate planning, we also call it plan giving, uh, could and should be mutually benefit to you and the charitable organization you're passionate about. So if you have an estate plan in place, or if you need to get an estate plan in place, now's the time to review the plan or get one in place. Life changes, tax and law changes can have substantial effect on your estate plan. You should review your estate plan after a major life event, such as a marriage, divorce, death in the family, and times like we're living in now, and Andrea, I hate the term also, through a pandemic such as COVID-19. But once you have an idea of who, why, and what you want to include in your estate plan, then you can go forward with making charitable planning an integral part of your plan, whether through a will, various trusts such as your, you can do it in a revocable trust, an irrevocable trust such as a charitable lead trust, charitable remainder trust, charitable gift annuity trust, donor advised funds, life insurance, whether in a trust or outright, bank accounts, stocks, mutual funds, cash, family foundations, retirement accounts, real estate, and other vehicles that will be discussed later in this webinar. And depending on how you leave your assets to a charity, make sure your beneficiary designations are up to date. 
and that you have the correct name of the charity and or organization. Missing and incorrect designations might have unintended consequences and your assets may not be distributed to the charity and or organization you wanted to benefit. And charitable planning is meant to be personally fulfilling to a person. And one of the first steps to charitable planning is to define your goals and objectives. It's important to find out which charities you're passionate about and figure out how you would like to support their efforts and the type of financial support you want to give that charity. It can be the college you graduated from, a museum, charity for animals, LGBT groups, children, churches, or other qualified charitable organizations such as Families First, anything you feel passionate about and is close to your heart. Charitable planning can take many forms during and after your death. So take the time to decide which charities you you want to support and once you define your goals you've already achieved a major step in planning your estate plan what you need to do is take the time to make sure you're making right decisions on how charitable giving can be part of your estate plan you can donate during your life or after your death with any type of planning it's important to balance your income needs your family's needs and balance that with the needs of the charities and the tax benefits as well as the enjoyment you will get from knowing you are making a difference and you also have to make the decision whether to give assets away during your life at, at your death but charitable giving can start while you're alive so you can see the impact it has on causes close to your heart and can of course you have to consider the tax benefits with proper planning you can give money to the charities you care the most about. So remember, charitable planning may help you minimize income taxes while you're alive and supporting the charities that are meaningful to you or at your death, which is previously mentioned, reduce federal and state estate taxes. Giving to a charity through your estate plan is not only personally fulfilling, but a great way to reduce taxes, which can otherwise put a financial burden on your beneficiaries. Leaving money to charity can reduce the amount included in your state and as a result, reduce estate taxes that would need to be paid. Charitable giving is smart estate planning. It can benefit both the donor and the charity. How you give, how you choose to give and why is up to you. So take the time to define your own personal goals for charitable giving and the time to decide what charities you want to support. And once you, you do that, it's important to meet with your attorney, CPA, development director at a charity such as Families First to make sure these goals are accomplished through your estate plan. Thank you. Three cheers for Robin. Boy, as a fellow estate planning attorney, how do you get estate planning and charitable giving in a five minute presentation? She did a fantastic job. Uh, she really underscored why it is so important that everyone has an estate plan. Uh, it's not just for the wealthy. Um, and she also highlighted a, a couple different mechanisms in terms of the way to give um, to charities, including during life or in a, a will instrument. And it can be, she, she took some of the myth out of how complicated it can be. Yes, there are very sophisticated estate planning um, uh, trusts, like a charitable remainder trust or charitable lead trust, but it can be as simple as I leave, I'll just pick families first as an example, I leave families first X amount of money at the time of my death or I leave X percentage to families first at the time of my death. It can be that simple. It can be changing the uh, beneficiary designation on a, a bank account or investment account. Um, so really for, for how much you covered and underscoring the importance of charitable giving and why we should give from the heart to the causes that we're committed to, I really commend you. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we're going to shift a little more to income tax, uh, on the income tax, which uh, Robin mentioned, but there's a lot of, because um, she also mentioned that uh, charitable planning should be mutually beneficial. So uh, Americans, by the way, are by far the most generous people in the world. Part of that is because our tax systems are set up where if you give to charity, then you are rewarded by the government through various tax advantages. Um, so we are going to bring up Michelle Ferrara. She is with uh, MBAF, uh, which you heard uh, before. It's a very, very reputable and venerable uh, public accounting firm, if you haven't heard of it. Um, so with nearly three decades of experience in the public accounting profession, Michelle concentrates on income tax planning and compliance for individuals, trusts, estates, and private foundations. Michelle, we welcome you here and thank you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate this. Good morning. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with the Families First of Palm Beach County organization and its supporters. 
In these challenging times during the COVID-19 pandemic, Families First, the Palm Beach County and its resources to families are more important more than ever to help them provide a safe and loving home for their children. With the end of the year approaching, what are some of the potential tax benefits to year-end charitable planning in the unique circumstances of 2020? First and foremost, I think we see the need in our communities. And with the passage of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or more commonly referred to as the CARES Tax Act in March of 2020, it provided some incentives to stimulate charitable giving. First, anyone can deduct up to $300 of charitable gifts, which will be an above the line tax deduction, even if you don't itemize deductions on your 2020 personal tax return. Next, the act also increased the limit on charitable deductions. In general, if you make a cash donation to a public charity, you may deduct on your personal tax return up to 60% of your adjusted gross income as a charitable deduction. For example, if your adjusted gross income is $100,000, you can deduct charitable contributions of $60,000 paid to a public charity and deduct the entire amount as a charitable contribution. The big change now for 2020 only, the CARES Tax Act raised that charitable deduction limit to 100% of your adjusted gross income. So for example, if your 2020 adjusted gross income is $100,000 and you donate $100,000 in cash to a public charity, you can deduct the entire $100,000 against your income for 2020. With the 100% charitable deduction limit for 2020, this may be very impactful for donors with outstanding charitable pledges that they may want to get that maximum tax benefit from their pledge by taking the larger tax deduction. And with that higher charitable tax deduction, individuals could also offset a large income tax event that occurred in 2020, such as the sale of a business or the conversion of a traditional uh, IRA into a Roth IRA. In addition, that CARES Tax Act also increased the limitation on corporations deduction for charitable contributions from 10% of their taxable income to 25% of their taxable income. However, this increase in the corporate charitable deduction limit is for 2020 only. So how does a donor take advantage of the 2020 charitable deduction limit of 100% of their adjusted gross income? First, the charitable donation must be made in cash and it must be made to a public charity and not a donor advised fund, as the CARES Tax Act excluded gifts to donor advised funds. The goal was to encourage the people to get the money out into the community. And so donations that are made to a donor advised fund, the normal 60% limit of your adjusted gross income will apply for 2020. Also, Keep in mind that you can make charitable contributions made to a qualified charitable organization in the tax year that the contribution was made. So therefore, you can technically deduct a contribution made late in December, and this rule also covers your donations made by a credit card. So for example, if you make an online donation to a charity by providing your credit card number by December 31st, that donation is gonna be deductible on your 2020 tax return even though you don't actually pay for those credit card charges until 2021. In addition, the rules regarding the donation of appreciated securities have not been changed with the charitable deduction limit for appreciated stock to a public charity is still at the limitation of 30% of your adjusted gross income. And with the donation of appreciated securities, you can accomplish multiple goals and in including the following. That donation of the appreciated securities is the charitable deduction would be for the full fair market value of that stock. In addition, you can avoid the capital gains tax on the sale of the stock as the donor would, would have been taxable had the asset been sold and then the sales proceeds contributed to the charity. Instead, with the donation of appreciated securities, the charity will receive the stock in kind and they can turn around and sell that appreciated stock without incurring any tax. With the election of President-elect Biden, his campaign proposals have, are 
for the increase in the ordinary income rates for individuals with income over $400,000 and capital gains tax rates for individuals over a million dollars. While the tax rates may be higher in 2021, it still may be beneficial for an individual to make those charitable contributions in 2020 as the Biden campaign platform would cap itemized deductions to a 28% tax benefit for those individuals earning more than $400,000 compared to a 37% tax benefit currently. However, at this time, none of us know how and when the tax laws will change. While most estate plans are gonna focus on leaving wealth to your heirs, some people have the goals to provide for charitable cause with their estate. For planning with charitable trusts, this strategy combines tax and charitable planning and a charitable remainder trust allows you to achieve both goals. The federal election results have, may have more of an impact if the capital gains tax rates are increased as it could make a charitable remainder trust more popular as a planning vehicle. A charitable remainder trust typically is used to avoid income taxes on the sale of an asset such as real estate, uh, publicly traded securities, or certain closely held stock, while at the same time providing that taxpayer with an immediate income tax deduction and a stream of payments for the term of that trust. A charitable remainder trust provides for the transfer of an appreciated asset into an irrevocable trust. It removes that asset from your taxable estate and the taxpayer will receive an immediate charitable tax deduction. There are two types of charitable remainder trusts. First, there is the Charitable Remainder Annuity Trust, which is commonly referred to as a PRAT, and this trust will pay a fixed annuity amount each year. The other type is called a Charitable Remainder Uni Trust, or a CRUT, and that trust will pay a fixed percentage of the assets within the account, which is revalued each year. When planning, it's important to remember that contributions to a Charitable Remainder Trust are irrevocable. On the trust funding, the trustee of the charitable remainder trust will sell that asset at full fair market value, paying no capital gains tax, and then will turn around and reinvest those sales proceeds in income producing assets, which would spread cash flow and the tax liability out as the beneficiaries receive the payments from that charitable remainder trust over the lifetime of the donors or for a term of years and then support a charity or charities as the remainder beneficiary. If you're considering selling an asset with total federal and state capital gains that might be close to or more than half of your gains, a charitable remainder trust might be a planning strategy to consider and review with your professionals for the tax benefits as there are rules and restrictions. With the holidays approaching at a time when charitable giving is needed more now than ever, the charitable incentives provided by Congress for 2020 to corporations and to individuals, it may provide donors with the enhanced benefits to help them fulfill these community needs in their charitable planning. Thank you. Wow, Ken, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I think, again, you know, if someone asks me to speak for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, it's a lot easier than being asked to give something in a five or seven minute presentation because every word counts and you really made every single word count. Um, and I think just a really quick takeaway is that a lot of these strategies need to be done by December 31st or at least booked, at least the credit card has to be processed because I was actually going to ask you that right. question, but you, you made that clear. Um, and then the other thing is we are in a very low interest rate environment right now. So some of these charitable trusts, charitable lead trusts, um, it gets way complicated. Uh, you can talk to Robin, you can talk to uh, Michelle afterwards, but uh, in a very low um, uh, income, uh, income um, excuse me, uh, in, a, in a very low uh, rate environment, you can uh, really take full advantage of some of these charitable uh, remainder trusts uh, because you, you get a bigger spread. So again, these are mutually beneficial. They help the charities, but they also uh, help the, the individuals as well. Uh, we have one more speaker here this morning. Uh, he has a very uh, tough act to follow, but he has assured me he is up for the task. He is actually gonna talk about one of the, uh, a great way to lead the charity, which is through various life uh, insurance strategies. One could be as simple as just naming a charity as a beneficiary in a life insurance policy, but there are other more sophisticated um, 
ways to use insurance as a way to giving to charities. So I am going to bring on fellow um, Legacy Planning Committee member, my friend, Christopher Dora Up. He is with NPC Financial. After a brief career playing professional football, Chris transitioned out of the game and dove headfirst into financial services as a financial planner. His expertise includes charitable planning, legacy planning, business exit, and succession planning. Chris sits on the Legacy Planning Committee for Families First of Palm Beach County. And before you talk, Christopher, I just want to let you know that when I first met Christopher, uh, he was telling me how he was involved in Big Brothers, uh, Big Brothers program and how committed he was to uh, family causes. And when I heard that, the, you know, I'm not the smartest attorney, but I'm not the dumbest one either. The bells went off and I'm like, Christopher, you ever hear of Families First of Palm Beach County? And he has been such a fantastic addition to, to our committee and to our organization. So no pressure, Christopher. Take the ball and put it over the end zone, okay? Well, well thank you so much, you know, Brian. I, I really appreciate you uh, bringing me into the organization. Julie, thank you so much. Samantha, when we all sat and got together, it was amazing. And, you know, this morning, thank you so much, gang, for us, you know, being able to share some insight. Um, you're right, you know, 30 years, you know, Families First has been here. So when you think about, you know, the next 30 years, what does that really mean? Well, you know, we have all faced, uh, you know, a detrimental situation, either personally, uh, emotionally, our family situation, our businesses and our organizations because of the COVID-19. So when you think about ways to leave a legacy and to really talk about perpetuity, what does that really mean when we talk about strategies? Well, what I want to share today is uh, really an example of how something that is already common, that's really well known with, you know, taking care of your family's legacy, taking care of your own estate planning, and taking care of your assets where you can now use a similar concept with life insurance. When people think about life insurance, it's really, well, you know what? I care about my family. I, I really want to make sure that if something were to happen to me, that I leave a benefit. So they're not on the hook to kind of figure it out. Well, what if I told you that there's also a concept where uh, the charity itself can actually, you know, look at life insurance as a tool with donors. Now, most of the time when donors, uh, you know, commit to a contribution or they commit to some form of resources that they'd like to give to an organization, it really benefits them with their taxes. So when you think about that, it really provides not only uh, momentum for the donor to continue to give, but at the same time, it really provides them with the capabilities of, of you know, really uh, growing the organization. So. When you think about life insurance, normally it's, you know, somebody uh, needs to qualify for a strategy and at some point, you know, if something happens, well, the organization um, can really look at, you know, leveraging life insurance. Charity owned life insurance is a concept where the organization itself is able to uh, own life insurance on donors. Now, this is a concept that has been around for many, many moons. But when you think about today, these are the concepts that are really allowing organizations not only to remain sustainable, but also for the organizations to have control to be able to grow uh, the infrastructure internally. Now, this concept is something that when you, when you look at it as a way of leaving a legacy, not only for the charity, it also becomes an advantage to you know, consider your families as well, where most of the time, a traditional life insurance policy would have a beneficiary, you know, titled to the life insurance benefit, meaning that if something were to happen to the insured person, you know, the, the contract would pay out a, a life insurance benefit. So let's think about this for a quick second. The charity now is able to have life insurance policies that donors are able to fund. So essentially, when you think about charity-owned life insurance, it becomes a tool. It becomes a tool in, in the sense of not only can a donor be able to look at life insurance as a strategic concept to help an organization grow further, 
When we're thinking about the next 30 years, and I'd like to second some of the other panelists who mentioned in regards to you know building reserves, uh, making sure that we can think about taxes, thinking about ways that we can really help the organization grow internally. Charity-owned life insurance has become a concept, but an improved concept, where organizations today look at strategic donors who'd like to really take care of their affairs, if it's you know really to provide a legacy to the organization, but at the same time also consider their families as well. And this concept is something where it really has uh, different advantages in regards to how the strategy works. This concept not only provides the charity a benefit at some point in the future, but also an immediate benefit today. There are certain types of life insurance contracts where there are life insurance contracts that grow cash value inside of these strategies. Imagine a charity having control of a life insurance contract and being able to understand that at some point in the future, that donor is no longer with us, there will be a benefit that the organization receives as a gift. But all in the same time, as the donor continues to gift this contribution, they receive a tax write-off. The charity still has control of the policy and the policy now starts to grow cash value. At any point in time during the journey, if there's ever a situation like a COVID-19 or a situation where we need to figure out how to grow uh, programs or how we're going to expand the vision, the organization that has control of the policy is able to access the cash value in the plan. Now, this cash value can be used for planning, it can be used for uh, growth, it can be used for uh, various activities to help the organization become and remain sustainable. So, so gang, I, I, I say it's, it's, it's a compliment when you're thinking about the state planning to be able to look at life insurance as a way to leave a legacy, not only to your favorite organization like Families First, but also to be able to provide assets, you know, for your family. I call this concept a two and a one. Really thinking about your favorite organization like Families First to be able to consider in regards to longevity and perpetuity, and at the same time taking care of your loved ones and making sure that they would also receive a benefit as well. Now, this charity-owned life insurance is something that can be customized. It can you know, really be a concept where it could really provide advantages for now and for the very future. So this concept is something where it can work. It can work not only for organizations that want to think about the next 30 years, but really it's a concept that can provide donors with key advantages as you know, not only for the sake of the growth of the organization, but also a way for donors to continue uh, con contributing, continue gifting uh, resources to really help the growth of an organization. And this really, at the end of the day, becomes a strategy where it benefits the donors' families, and it also benefits the growth of the organization. So charity on life insurance is a type of concept that could be relevant to uh, many different types of donors as well. Uh, whether a donor wants to consider uh, planning for a legacy, uh, whether a donor wants to consider uh, providing resources that allows the charity to always have control of the resources. So Brian, thank you so much uh, you know, for uh, introducing me and allowing me to share a little bit about the concept of charity-owned life insurance. Uh, donors, if, um, if you are interested to learn more, um, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, to uh, Samantha, Julie, myself, Brian, anyone on the team for us to really educate you a little further on how this could be a strategy that can complement your overall estate planning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher. Uh, it really is, uh, as you can see, uh, 
there are all ways to uh, accomplish your charitable objection, objectives and, and those of your clients for those uh, who are on the call who uh, may be financial advisors or, or financial professionals. Um, so we have left a little time for questions and um, I believe Gabby is gonna unmute the mic. So if anyone has a question and would like to uh, ask it out loud, they can do that if they feel uh, more comfortable putting it on the chat and I can ask it, that's fine. But um, who has a question out there? Anyone? All right, well, I actually, ha I have one. Um, you know, I think um, I think Robin had mentioned about retirement plans before, and as a good way, uh, as a good charitable giving um, strategy. I know the rules are a little bit different this year, COVID, but um, probably Robin or Michelle, maybe either one of you could speak to um, why sometimes we look to retirement accounts, um, uh, RMDs, for example, uh, as as an asset to give to charity. Michelle, why don't you? Uh talk about that. We all know for 2020, the CARES Act suspended the requirement for your required minimum distribution. Um, so, but I think it's a great planning opportunity for people um, that have their required minimum distribution. They can make that uh, $100,000 uh, qualified charitable distribution to the charity of their choice. And then the uh, IRA distribution is not included into income. So it's a way to kind of um, maximize your charitable giving with a distribution that you have to take and you won't have to pay the income tax on that distribution, but you also don't get a charitable deduction for it. But the money would then be drawn straight from their account and go straight to the charity. Okay. Uh Question from Christopher, is there a dollar amount an organization should consider for their reserves? How should organizations come up with the amount? That is actually a very great question. We talk about building reserves, but what would be a reasonable target for a charity? Great question. Um, so it depends on the organization. Each organization is different. And so at a um, strategic level, you wanna take a step back and say, um, what's our operating model? What does it look like? And what do we need to have um, set aside to sustain us? So I'll give you a recent example that I just worked on um, with the Myrtle Beach Chamber of Commerce. And they called me and they said, you know, our job is to promote tourism to Myrtle Beach, right? And he, th during the pandemic, of course, the beaches were closed, the hotels were closed, and they wanted to have a, an operating reserve policy drafted that would say, you know, what does it mean for us to have long-term viability during, in, in, in their minds, they were saying hurricane. You know, all of a sudden the beach gets wiped out by a hurricane. And so we crafted it where they would have two years of operations set aside. And they, they're a pretty big organization. Their marketing budget was something like $60 million a year. And so we, um, we put a, crafted a policy where they would be setting aside um, $12 million dollars. Um, in operating reserves to sustain them for two years. Um, I also went back and made sure, you know, when we look at the watchdogs and all that stuff, which I'm, I'm done with them, um, and I said, uh, you know, what's the wording that's out there? BBB said, the Better Business Bureau said that they, would, they were recommending three years of operations. So you take your budget and families first, I, I'm guessing off the top of my head, I think it's in the five million range. And if you were to say, we need to put aside three years um, so that, that takes time to build and um, for long-term viability. Okay, well, thank you. That was really, uh, really useful information uh, for, for us as well. Um, and let me, let me just ask you another question. Um, you know, one of the things that Families First does is we have um, our own investment account uh, for the endowment, um, but we also have some with the Community Foundation uh, because we want to make sure that uh, for those donors who may be a little uh, worried about the longevity, although Family First has been around 30 years, very stable, but um, you know, make sure that there's a place that they know those dollars will never be uh, put to waste. So could you talk to about maybe what are some of the obstacles or, or ways that organizations should go about planning for the donor that um, you know, may be hesitant to contribute to a charity that you know, they don't know it's going to be around in 20 years or 30 years? That's very unreal. 
That was for me? Yeah, that was for oh. you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, we're going to be off the hot so, seat after this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm off the hot seat? Okay. Um, a lot of our conversations are with, um, when we look at financial viability of an organization with a donor. So what we want to do is we want to take a look at the organization's strengths. And, and that might mean at, in, the, in the first stages of those conversations with an organization, they might not be that strong. And so we like to have conversations with donors to say, we want you to give, you know, we don't want to stop the money from going over there, but let's think about what would be the best way for that organization to get support. And it might not be programmatically related. It might be that that organization needs a new development person. It might be that organization needs better IT and equipment. And so we look at what, what we say for program to be a success, we want to strengthen the house too. And then as we're strengthening the house and, and creating long-term viability, you're, you're setting the organization up to, for success. And so that's kind of the conversation. And that's my favorite conversation to have at the table. Well, that's awesome. So thank you. Um, I have another question. Uh, this is from uh, Russ Johnson. Great to, great to see you, Russ, that you're here. Thank you for being here. Uh, is the charity listed with the donor advised funds of assorted investment services companies such as Wells, Merrill Lynch, et cetera? I checked the uh, RJA list and Families First is not listed. A campaign may be useful in order to expand your footprint for donations. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, the answer is yes, we do have it. Um, I believe if we're with uh, Merrill Lynch. Um, if, if I'm wrong, Sam, correct me, but we're, our investment account is with Merrill Lynch, I think, presently. Um, and um, I don't know about the RJA, so that may be something that we should be looking into. Um, but um, good, good insight, so I appreciate that. Uh, I think we have time for at least one more question. So this one is for Michelle. Um, in regards to RMDs and the SECURE Act for individuals who do not really need to take the income, is it more of an advantage to give to a charity or something else? Well, I, I, you know, with the 100% charitable deduction limitation, you know, someone could still take that RMD and then turn around and give that cash to a public charity and offset that income draw with a full um, charitable deduction. Um, I, I think that, you know, a lot of people, they were late to, when the CARES Act came out in March, some people already took their required minimum distributions. Um, and I don't think they have provisions yet about, you know, you only have the 60 day uh, to put the money back in order to not have it be taxable. So for certain people, yes, you could, if you did take your RMD in 2020, it might make sense then to, turn around and give some money to charity and you can offset that income dollar for dollar. Great, thank you. All right, well, I wanna thank everyone for, uh, for being here. I wanna thank especially our panelists, as I said, and as you have seen, uh, we really had a, a star-studded lineup, uh, some people with a lot of experience uh, across charitable, um, charitable foundations in, in general, um, and char charitable giving. Uh, as well as tax professionals, estate planning attorneys, professionals, insurance professionals. So uh, we hope we gave you a really uh, wide ranging um, overview. Obviously we jammed a lot of information in a short period of time. Um, I'm sure we can make our the, the contact information of all our panelists available if you have any specific questions for any of them. If you have any questions uh, either specific or or generic uh, to, to, for Families First, uh, myself, Christopher, Sam, Julie, uh, we're all here to help and support and answer any questions you have. Uh, hopefully we demonstrated that, um, you know, that Families First is really doing just phenomenal work, especially through COVID. It's more important than ever that we carry on some of these programs than we have, um, but we want to help a lot more than just, you know, a lot more 14 year olds who lose their, their mom or other unfortunate situations. So again, thank you uh, to, to any donors on the call. We really appreciate your support. Thank you for everyone being here. Um, and it's really been, been my pleasure. Uh, it's been a, great, um, been a great opportunity for me uh, to be connected with Families First. So with that, uh, I will say thank you very much. Thank you. For attending, everyone. Thank you.
Thank you.